Hello everyone and welcome to our last video. Boy, this term has gone by really quickly. I've really enjoyed having you in class. I've enjoyed reading your papers. I look really forward to your final wikis. And that's one of the things that I want to talk about in this last video before we get to some of the statements that you made about the readings. So first off with your conclusions, I think you have some good summary of what you've done, but a couple of things that I want you to think about as you write both the conclusion and the final wiki. Remember the wiki is designed as a starter. You want to provide enough information and background to get the topic going and to get people talking about it, but you also want to give them plenty of opportunities to offer their input. That's one of the reasons why I wanted to see the rough drafts of your conclusion. So I could see your call to action, what specifically you're asking for the audience to give you and to build the wiki on, but also what rules that you've set up for monitoring and policing those conversations. I've added a bunch more successful examples of wikis to the Blackboard site so you can see what students have done. And I'll show a couple here in the video because I like some of the ways that they've approached both the questions that they've asked and the rules that they've set up. This one, for example, is just a good summary of everything that I'm looking for. So very specific questions that are factually based and don't ask for too much opinion. Um, and also rules. And the rules are simple. She only has three rules on this wiki, um, but they can make a huge difference. Also, contact information um, needs to be prominent. This is actually the introduction to one of the wikis for my class last semester. And right on that first page, she has a link to how you can contribute. This is also another good example of the different rules that students have offered. You don't have to offer as many rules as the student did. You don't have to be quite as explicit. This last example are another set of really good questions that ask for specific things that aren't so specific that people are going to just say yes or no, but give real direction on where people can contribute. And in all that we've seen of participation literature, for the last quiz there were a couple of questions that I think threw you a little bit. I know this, qu this quiz was a bit more difficult than others. So this first question, what is the main problem with the government's support for technologies that circumvent internet censorship? The correct answer was the U.S. approach is largely designed to ensure people have access to Voice of America and other national propaganda, uh, but there were some more overarching reasons behind that as well. And so that's why I actually did give you credit if you answered, circumvention is much less helpful to people seeking to create their own content and build locally based information communities and networks. The next question asked the difference between internet tyranny and freedom. With this question I didn't end up giving you extra credit on it even though only 28% of you answered correctly, because I think that was a key point that McKinnon was really pushing toward. That it doesn't matter what kind of regulation or when, it's just how we're going to regulate it and make sure that we're going to do it in a way that opens the internet up to more people rather than shuts it down. McKinnon also asked what the value proposition is. This is a kind of a loaded business term that we talk about in my entrepreneurial class, but I think she used it really interestingly to talk about what role the internet should really play in our lives and how it should be regulated. The correct answer here was a public acknowledgement of the value of open communication, but also the recognition of the need to be specific, accountable specifically to its audience and the open internet community in general. That's how most of you answered, and I think that is a correct answer. That's actually kind of more overreaching than just acknowledging the value of the internet. The last question that threw you guys was from the Turkle reading where she asked us what we need to know before we look for social robots in our lives. Um, and this was another kind of key concept that I wanted you to get out of the readings. So while some of the other answers seemed correct, the only real correct answer was understand what the question really is. It's not always an either slash or proposition. Each week I choose an example to try to underscore what we're talking about and give you a, a real world context for it. And the one that keeps popping up in my emails is Jibo. It was developed by an MIT professor named Cynthia Brazil, um, who's actually a colleague of Sherry Turkle's. And when asked why she's developing it, this is what she said. It's really important for technology to be humanized. The next stage in computing, the next wave is emotion. That's one thing that I think she's trying to integrate into Jibo if you watch some of the videos. But what do you think Turkle thinks? The moment you make a robot in human form and the moment it can make eye contact, track your motion and gesture towards you, you're kind of toast because you believe that there is somebody home. In other words, a consciousness, even potentially something with feeling, and that is like you. I also always try to connect the readings to journalism. 
And so I challenge my students in, the, in my classes to think, were there, are there any applications for robots in journalism? At the University of Nebraska, they actually have a drone journalism lab. And in fact, the founder of the lab, Matt Waite, has given a number of TED Talks about how drones can be used in journalism. And it's not as something as simple as, well, do we fly them into disaster areas to get aerial views? Um, he talks about, you know, that we really need a set of ethical guidelines to determine how we use drones because they can get so up close and personal. You know, they can kind of break some of those social walls. So let's see what you guys had to say about how technology integrates into the journalism and the work that we're doing. In fact, one of you called technology a type of new religion in relation to journalism. In the past, societies put their faith in a god. Today, we put our faith in technology, that someday our innovation will save us from ourselves. I thought that was a really interesting echoing of some of the things that Turkle said. And it's one of those things that we have to be careful of. You know, technology is important, but we have to remember that we're in control, and that we make technology to suit our needs. Along those same lines, the internet only has value if we use it effectively. Like McKinnon says, the value proposition of the internet is to empower the people. How amazing is that? Something so large in scale and yet so ambiguous is making such a splash because it is giving the consumer the one thing a product cannot, empowerment. I really like this statement and I want all of us to remember that word, empowerment. That's what the internet should be doing. That's what we need to seek to do with our journalism. That's how we need to regulate it as we approach things like net neutrality. A lot of you brought up some really interesting questions about how we integrate technology into the journalism that we're doing as well. It brought our understanding of the way that technology operates to a head by bringing in some of the more complicated, general, overarching questions that we should be asking of ourselves as stewards of online community and technological progression. This student was really sharp in saying we need to ask ourselves those questions. But what really are the questions? What are the key things that we need to know about how technology integrates into the journalism that we're doing in order to make it really empower people? Democracy is decentralized government, and the Internet is decentralized information. They both share some of the same benefits and pitfalls. These systems are naturally open, and when they are open, they work. When they are closed down and exploited by the powerful, they become toxic. I thought this comparison between government and Internet is a great answer to one of the questions that we need to ask. You know, how do we make it more open? There's lots of lessons that we've learned from democracy that we can apply to the Internet. Finally, I always like to leave you on an, on an upbeat note, and I thought one of you really summed that up well. The Internet is by no means alive, nor shall it ever be. It will only become what we, as users and consumers, make of it. The challenge that I would leave you with is to find ways that we can make the Internet our own. Take the journalism skills that you've already learned in classes and try to apply them to the Internet, understanding some of the things that we've talked about, how the Internet is inherently social, how communities form online, um, how journalists are already approaching it, and how they can integrate community more into what they're doing. One more statement from you guys about how we can take hold of the future and make it work for us rather than against us. Citizens need to stop acting as passive users and instead recognize that they are a key part of the innovation equation. What they desire, corporations will deliver. What they request, democratic governments will implicate. And I just wanted to end on this one statement that one of you made. I know it's kind of long, but I thought it was really powerfully worded. As I follow the developments of the TPP bill, the Charleston shooting, the rise of Bernie Sanders, I am provided an emotional gateway through which to experience compassion, a technological portal through which I am afforded an opportunity to cooperate and experience. I am tempted here to say I want to emulate this portal for compassion in my own writing, but that is a fallacy. It is not writing alone that creates this portal, but the means provided by internet capabilities that offer us this simulation of presence. So I revise and say I want to embody this portal for compassion by not just writing. I really like that statement because the student not only brought in what we've read this semester, but some of the techniques that he's learned in other classes about why we need to add interactivity to some of the things that we do, why we need to involve multiple media, why we need to bring our audiences into journalism online and not just write or make videos anymore. If you have any questions about your final projects, just let me know. Remember, those are due on Friday. That's about the last day that I can accept them in order to get grades turned in next week. In addition, if you have any logistical problems, let me know about that. Most people, like I said, use Wikia for these projects. That seems pretty self-explanatory, pretty easy to integrate in. 
Um, look at those examples that I've listed on Blackboard because I think almost all of those use Wikia except the one that I did. Um, if you also want to use the Wiki in Blackboard, I have some instructions on our Blackboard site about how to do that. But regardless, let me know how you're doing and if there's anything I can do to help you. Thanks again for this class. Have a great rest of the summer.